Uh, as a quick introduction, in case this is your first jumping in point, my name is Michael, and this sequence on YouTube is meant to be kind of like a, a classroom. Uh, I taught classes for approximately six years, and so I teach, I record these videos, and I don't edit them. It's pretty much a stream of consciousness. You know, you might hear me stutter a little bit or uh, mess up my words a little, but that's okay. Just like I would be in a classroom, there's no way for me to edit what I say uh, in a classroom. I can't go back and redo it, right? So it's pretty much going straight from my brain to here. So if you notice any kind of weird stutters or whatever, that's why. In any case, uh, also it's assumed, however, if this is a jumping on point for you, that everything that we've talked about in previous parts of this playlist on YouTube, you've watched or at least understand. So we've gone over in the last video a kind of a basic modeling demo. We model something very simple like a pencil and kind of showing that process and at least my process and uh, talking about uh, different tools as we went along and different techniques and, and uh, things like that. So I encourage you to, to do that. Go back and look at the videos prior if you haven't already because we are assuming all that knowledge is there. Uh, today, the plan is to talk about texturing. Now, texturing is a big topic. If you know, imagine in uh, any kind of studio environment where you're creating artwork, Maya, this program that we're using here, can be used for a number of different jobs, like a full-on job. You know, we, there's 3D modelers out there that create models. There's texture artists, right, that use Maya as well as other programs to create textures. There's animators, right? There's visual effects people who like particle effects and all these different um, visual effects that way using Maya and other programs as well. So there's lots of jobs that Maya can provide. So a lot of times we talk about, you know, all these things Maya can do as if you're going to do all of them in a job. Most of the time when you get a job, you're going to be, you know, an artist who's creating visual effects, for example. So you might very rarely do any animation as far as like you might really very rarely do any character animation put it that way you'll be animating the effect of course if you're doing like a uh, i don't know let's just say a very basic explosion or something you're animating the explosion to make it happen but you're not necessarily then going to turn around and animate a character you know talking and lip syncing and all that kind of that's a whole other job you know what i mean so knowing how to do all these things is great but Eventually, hopefully, what you'll you'll do as you continue your path learning how Maya works is you'll kind of pick up where your interests lie and focus more on what you'd like to do as far as a career goes. Now, I will say that I would say just estimating 80% of people out there who start out using Maya and go off and, and get a job, the vast majority of those people are probably modelers. Like they're 3D modeling things. They're texturing things. Props you know, vehicles, you know, environmental structures like walls and ceilings and floors and rocks and bushes and trees, and all these different things, right? That's that's 80% of what's all out there as far as the jobs go. So I feel like it's a good fundamental um, foundation for you to know how to model and texture, okay? If, if nothing else, you can get a job doing that. That's what a lot of my job is, actually, just modeling and texturing things. I have over the years done other things, too, but that's the majority. So anyway, so... Modeling, right? We, we started talking about that already, but then texturing, like, okay, texturing, how do we do that? So, I do, there are out there texture artist jobs, like, all they do is texture, but I will say it feels like to me at least half of the 3D modelers out there, if not more, are also expected to texture their models. They're not just going to make the model and ship it off to the next person to texture. Most of the time, or at least it seems like half the time at least, they're also going to be expected to texture that same model. So that's what I did also a lot of the time. I would model and texture. That was my, my job. So when it comes to starting texturing, we need to understand how texturing works. And again, I'm going into this as if you know nothing. All right. So if you know some basics, great. Just bear with me. We'll get to, we'll catch up to where you are eventually. But if you know nothing about texturing, all you know, like you, maybe you don't even know what the word texturing means. Let's start there. So first of all, a texture is an image. Let me bring up one real quick. Okay, so here we have an example of a texture. Now this is only one type of texture, and there are lots of types of textures to talk about. I just wanted to show you this though. This is an image. Uh, it might look very like unrecognizable. It's a lot of green and browns and such, and like, okay, well, I don't understand what's happening. That's okay. 
Uh, this texture here is for this uh, fire extinguisher prop here. This program I'm looking at now is called Substance Painter, which we will probably get to eventually on this channel talking about. But just as a point of reference, you can kind of see these labels on the side of this canister, as well as over here. You can kind of see this one there, and how it's kind of wrapped around this uh, cylinder in the middle of this, uh, this piece of equipment. Here, if we go back to the file, you can kind of see right there, there's that label, right? And here's these labels over here. So this down here, the section of the texture is what's wrapped around this cylinder of this model. So you can kind of see it represented there. So you have these instructions here and so on versus here. If I can zoom in, you can kind of see there. There's those same instructions. Okay. So Substance Painter is my texturing application of choice. I don't necessarily create textures in Maya per se. This is this and this right here I'm looking at is Photoshop, okay, <laughs> in case you're not aware of that too. So there's three different applications I have open right now, Maya, Photoshop, and Substance Painter. So it's very common to use all three of these programs in conjunction together to create something. And so this is just uh, one example. In Photoshop, I can take this texture in here, and let's just say, for example, I come in here and, well, let's say I want to make this a little bit less rusty. I can use my Photoshop tools, you know, if I wanted to. Oops. Make sure I have the right layer selected, and it's not locked. And I can start kind of painting over some of the stuff, and you know, removing, removing the rust where I don't want it to be, right? And in, in Photoshop, if I, if that was the way I wanted to go about doing it, so Photoshop is an image editing software. Substance Painter is a 3D texturing software. I could also uh, do that same sort of thing here if I wanted to make the rust less. It's using different tools. Here's the rust here, for example. And so if I start painting on here, it'll start removing the rust. You see that? In this particular section, anyway. Yeah, so you can, you can come in here and paint on the model and play with how much uh, rust we have to deal with, that kind of thing. So these are two applications that I highly recommend you get access to, uh, Substance Painter and Photoshop. Um, Substance Painter, I know, has a educational license, so you could potentially get it for free that way. Uh, and Photoshop, I'm not sure. It perhaps I don't know if uh, Adobe Creative Suite has a student or a educational license or not. I'm not positive about that. Um, actually, now to think about it, Adobe recently purchased Substance Painter, so this program here also is part of the Adobe library. So I might be uh, out of date as far as the educational licenses thing goes, since that's a recent change as of this recording um, over the last year or so. So you know, look into it, see if you can maybe find a free educational license. Usually, most of the time, these, pro these people who make these programs, they want you, as in students, to learn how to use their programs, right? Therefore, that means you'll buy their programs later. You know, that's the idea. So usually, they'll have some kind of way for you to learn how to use these applications in one way or the other uh, with free uh, educational licenses. So I definitely recommend getting such things um, because... If you want to know how to texture in the modern era, Photoshop and Substance Painter, there's also Substance Designer and all these other programs too that aren't as required, are definitely the way to go. You know, texturing just strictly in Maya, while it's possible, it's not, it's not what you want to do. Okay, so definitely look into, uh, here's Photoshop, Substance Painter, and then Maya, right? So these are the three. These three programs, especially, go hand in hand. And then, if not Photoshop, then definitely Substance Painter. If, if I had to recommend one, Substance Painter would be it. All right. So let me actually open up that uh, fire extinguisher model here, just to show you. Okay. So here's the 3D model. So you can kind of see it here. Um, so when it comes to texturing this model, let's say you went through the process, you created the model. Okay. Now you want to texture it. What do you got to do? Well, we can't really talk very much about texturing before we start talking about UVs. UVs. So UVs are texture coordinates on a model. I'm going to isolate just this one kind of pill-shaped, cylindrical shape here. So this, let's say you want to texture this thing here, then we would need texture coordinates. Now what are texture coordinates? All right. So we're going to be throwing a lot of information at you, at you today. Um, this is going to be kind of more of a learning video than a doing video. You might go back and try it later once you kind of get the idea behind it. But 
definitely a learning process here, kind of figuring out what we're all talking about. So just for the sake of example, I'm going to assign a new material to this object. So again, materials, textures, all these things. There's lots to talk about. Obviously, it's, it's hard to determine what to talk about first. Um, let's do that though. So textures, we talk as we've established as a 2D image. Here we go. Let me go back here. This is a, a 2D image here in Photoshop. And this square 2D image is wrapped around the 3D model, like you can see here. Actually, if I bring up this view, this might be easier to see. This, this one has a nice shaded look to it. Let me close some of these windows. There we go. So this is the 2D texture that is applied to this 3D object. Okay. And now that you see it here in Substance Painter, it's a little bit different than Photoshop, right? Because you can see that kind of shaded look to it. As I move the lights around, you can kind of see how the light is interacting on the model as well as on the texture where the light's coming from. So it's kind of kind of trippy. Um, so as I were to, actually I need some of these windows. Let me pull this back up here. So like this rust, for example. If I were to start painting, you can see here that how that, where I'm, creating that stroke is happening on the model. I can do it over here and it shows up on the model or I can paint it on the model and it shows up over there. If I go over here and start doing that as well, you can kind of see there how just kind of painting right there on there. So the all these different sections here on this 2D image are representing different parts of this 3D image. And it might be, again, difficult to understand exactly right at first. Okay. And if I bring up, let's say, this button here, you can see the wireframe, that red wireframe shows up on this side over here. So this is what's called a UV layout, where you're laying out, you can see here on this, all those red lines that represent the geometry of the model, you're laying out this, this geometry over here, you're kind of spreading it out on this square over here. What? How do you do that? Right? We're going to talk about all this. That's a texture. That's what a texture is, a 2D image applied to the model. Now, how do you apply this to the model? Well, that's where you come up with a material. So there's material and texture. So let me go back to Maya. Okay, so here in Maya is where the material gets applied. So I'm going to right-click and hold on this model. We've talked about the components before, edges, vertices, and faces, and so on. But if you go down this long list, here we have material stuff. We have assign a new material. We can assign a favorite material if you've created favorites, or assign an existing material. Here's a material that's already in my scene. You can see here I have a list of materials that are already in my scene right here. So I'm going to go ahead and assign a new material. Again, I'm holding down the right mouse button this whole time as I'm going down this list. I'm going to go to Assign New Material, let go, and it gives me this material list I can choose from here of what kind of material I want to apply. Now, this is the beginning. We're talking about this. I'm not going to go into like all the different material types, but just note that if you want a basic material, Lambert is the most basic material you can choose from. So I'm going to do that to start with, and I use Lambert all the time. Just because it's basic doesn't mean you never use it when you're more advanced. I use Lambert all the time, every day. So I'm going to apply a Lambert by clicking on the Lambert option. Okay, and then for me, the attribute editor popped up automatically, and here we have Lambert 5, because in my case, I have more than one Lambert in the scene, so it automatically numbers them. Yours is probably, say, Lambert 2. And you might say, well, why do I have Lambert 2 versus Lambert 1? Well, Lambert 1 is a material that's the default material that is applied to everything in your scene. Every time you make a new object, like a cube here. This cube, if you notice, has Lambert 1 applied. Lambert 1 is the default material that everything comes with, and it just looks like this gray uh, color. The reason why it's gray is because Lambert 1 is gray. Now, the number one rule I'd recommend is don't mess with Lambert 1. Okay, Don't adjust its color, don't change its ambience or incandescence, all these things. Like You can do all this stuff, but every time you do that, if you make any change, like now it's you know going to be hot pink or something, and kind of glowing or whatever, yeah, that looks cool for whatever it is I'm trying to do. But now anything else I make, 
Like I make another cylinder, for example, that thing is also hot pink and glowing. If I make a you know a sphere over here to, for other another reason, that is also hot pink and glowing because everything uses Lambert One by default. So I highly recommend you leave Lambert One <laughs> at the defaults. Let's see if I can get back to it now. So something like this. Okay. So just leave Lambert One alone. Don't mess with it. If you ever want to make a color change, you would apply a new material and then make the color change to that. So now, now that color change only happens to the new object, the new material that has, you know, in your case, Lambert Two, perhaps. In my case, Lambert Five. So Lambert Five, this is a material. So what is a material? A material is essentially, if you think of it this way, as a container of all the textures that you're going to use for your model. Those textures I showed you earlier for the fire, the extinguisher here. This is a a texture over here. There we go. That gets applied to the material on my fire extinguisher. Okay. Well, again, we'll talk about all this stuff more and more as we keep going. This might be more a couple parts here to get through all this information. It's a lot to it. Okay. So Lambert, you know. 5 in this case and you can rename this instead of Lambert 5 or Lambert 2 whatever it is I can just name this you know test material or something like that okay so we have here you see all these different attributes all these different settings of the, the material of the Lambert I've made and there's there's a ton of them if I keep expanding these out now every one of these or at least the vast majority of them You'll notice on the very far right side of the slider or the number or whatever it is, we'll have this little black and white checkerboard icon. This black and white checkerboard icon is where you can apply a texture to that setting. Again, the texture is the 2D image and the material is the container for all those textures. And when I say all those textures, you might be thinking, well, how many textures am I really going to be using? Right? Well, it varies. It's not always the same. The one I showed you here in here we go, this one in Photoshop, this is a color texture. So this texture controls the color of the fire extinguisher. Let me open up another one. So here's another one. So you see there's the this is the color texture. And this one, this is called an ambient occlusion texture. It's another kind of texture. You see it's a little bit different. And this one is specifically, just to, you know, just to get you curious, is talking about uh, self-shadowing and things. And actually if I go to Substance Painter, what I can do here is I can press these buttons until, here we go, this is the ambient occlusion texture displayed on the model. So you can kind of see that where these bars cross close to the tank, this little shadowing effect happens. That's what these that's what this is here, this shadow, this darkening on this section of the texture, that's what that is. And so we're creating this ambient occlusion, you see down here where these little cracks and crevices are, this darkening that happens. So now if I go back to the material, it's kind of hard to tell exactly, but if that ambient occlusion was not there, this would look much worse. <laughs> um, you wouldn't have quite as realistic a look, and you can kind of see it here, let me bring the light around. Again, it's very subtle, but we get a little bit of that shadowing here. And if I bring this, you can kind of see it here as well on the 2D side. The effect that we're getting there. But yeah, that's the ambient occlusion texture. And you see as I'm cycling through these, there's lots of textures that I have been applied to this model to make it look the way it does. So we're going to talk about all that. Don't get me wrong. You might be thinking, oh man, this is a lot of information. And it is. It totally is. But we have to start somewhere, right? We're not, I'm not expecting you, or no one should expect to know everything uh, the first time they start looking at and learning something. Okay? So it takes some time to kind of grasp everything. So don't get, don't get discouraged. So anyway, so you can see here, though, all these different attributes, color, transparency, ambient color, incandescence, bump mapping, diffuse, all these things. You can apply a texture to each one of these if you really wanted to. Now, the 99.99% of the time, you won't do that. You'll only use a certain number of these. Like, on, in general, I use maybe five, something like that. Color is, is probably used most often out of all of them. You know, at the very least, you'll have a color texture that you apply to your model. 
transparency. You know, if your object is not transparent, you'll just leave this black and not apply anything to it. However, if it's like a window or has, has glass or something like that, then all of a sudden, okay, yeah, I want some transparency. You can see here as I increase this slider, the object becomes transparent. Now, a texture applied to transparency can control where the object is transparent and where it's not. So let me show you some of these things, okay? So the color, let's look at color first. That's the most obvious one. I'm going to apply a texture to the color setting of this material. So I'll click over here on this little checkerboard icon next to color. It brings up this list. Again, it's like, okay, you want to apply a texture? Maya understands that. Here's your list of options for what kind of texture to apply. There's a bunch. Now I will, again, say 99% of the time, You'll be creating your own textures in Photoshop or Substance Painter, in which case you would use a file. And that what that file means is going to your computer and browsing to find the textures you've made elsewhere and brings them into Maya to apply. For the sake of this example, though, let's use a checkerboard I, a texture up here, checker. Okay, so now we've applied, a, this is called a procedural texture, a texture that Maya comes with. It's not something that were, was made in Photoshop or Substance Painter or anything like that. And you can apply it to, to things in Maya. Okay. Nothing happened though. You'll notice that you know nothing seems different about this. That's because right now I'm looking at the shaded view of my model. This is where a lot of my students have to be reminded to turn on the textured view. It's a toggle you have to press. The six key, six on the keyboard, and see here turns on textured view. I can see the checkerboard now. Four is wireframe. Five is shaded view, that's what I was looking at before, and then six is textured view. So with textured view turned on with the six key, I can see now, here's the checkerboard. Now to get back to the Lambert, you'll notice I'm, I'm now looking at the checker uh, node and, the, and its attributes. I can change the color of the checkerboard. For example, instead of being black and white, it could be you know, yellow and green, <laughs> for example. I'll go back to black and white. Okay. To get back to the Lambert, I can either click on the object, it kind of goes back to the Lambert itself or the material, or it might even go over here to one of the other tabs. But you can always click on these tabs to go back to your material. And now if I look at my material, you'll see color no longer has a checker icon. It has this little black arrow. And so what happens if I click on this is it takes me to the texture, the checker texture. And so I can, again, continue to, I can mess with the texture if I need to. Now to go back to the material, up here we have these two buttons. You notice this button here reminds you of that black arrow we just saw. This one is like the reverse of that. So clicking that button, the reverse, takes me back to the material. So you see here, I want to make sure you get this correlation. This kind of black square with a black arrow on the left side of the square looks just like this arrow here, right? Except this one's white. Click this black arrow, and then to get back, I click this white box with the arrow on the right side to get back. So it's like going back and forth. If I click it again, you know, oh, I messed up, went too far. Well, I'll just click it to go back the other way. You know, so this is kind of going back and forth down the chain, back and forth, back and forth. And if you get confused as where you are, you can just click on the object again and go back to the material with this tab. So we here we've applied that color. Uh, texture, the checkerboard, to the color attribute of the material. So that Maya knows that where any texture that's applied to color should show up like it is here as a color texture on the model. Okay. Same with transparency. Let's say I want to apply that same checkerboard pattern to the transparency. I can, I can use the same checker node, however, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to make a new one. So I'll click on the checkerboard icon under transparency or next to transparency. Again, I'll use a checker. And here you can see the result of this. Again, make sure six key is turned on for that texture view. So everywhere the checkerboard was white, the object is transparent. And everywhere the checkerboard is black, the object is opaque. Okay. With that in mind, if you can imagine, say, creating an object that has like a glass window, if you were to make a texture for the transparency for that glass window, then everywhere the frame is, the transparency texture would be black. Everywhere the window is, the transparency texture would be white. Okay? Because then you're going to 
uh, make the window transparent. Now what you should actually do is if you want the window to be semi-transparent right now that you can like this this looks like there's holes in the model right you can just completely see right through it if this checker pattern instead of being white what if it was gray so that the more the darker the, the white color gets toward black where black is, is now opaque but the darker it gets toward there the more semi-transparent we can be so for like a window again using that example you don't necessarily want it to be so transparent that you can't even tell there's glass there right you want to be able to see a little something so maybe like a little bit of a light gray in your transparency and now i can kind of see okay there's something there it's just see-through right so again instead of it being white where the glass is now it's kind of a almost white you know a very light gray okay so you can kind of hopefully see how that is working together so i click again click this little bottom button of these two squares to go back you can see here we have our two textures applied to these two settings of the material. So again, this material is containing all these textures, like a, like a box you put all your textures in. And you're applying it to all these different attributes. So all of these, can, again, like I said, can have texture applied. But the vast majority of the time, you wouldn't necessarily do that. You know, you would apply just to what you want to control. If you, if you need transparency, you'd apply a texture to the transparency. Most of the time, you do need color, so you apply a texture there and so on. Now how does Maya know where the texture should be displayed on the model? How does Maya know that? Because if you're making a texture where for a window, for example, it's, you need to be very specific as to how Maya knows that the window is here versus there, right? So the glass transparency part, part is displaying the way you want it to. Well that's where UVs come in, like I mentioned before. So UVs are texture coordinates. The coordinates on the model telling Maya Hey, the, this part of the texture goes here, this part of the texture goes there, and so on. Like, Because you saw here in Substance Painter how I have all these different sections of this texture designated for different parts of the model. And that's the UVs, the UV layout, and getting that set up. Okay, so a lot to take in. Okay, I know we're, we're already gone a long ways and I've thrown a lot out, out you just without even going into UVs yet. So just keep that in mind. If you need to pause and you go back and watch watch part of what I've talked about before again, that's the that's the beauty of YouTube, right? You can do that. If you have questions, you're not sure, um, ask in the comments too, and I'll be sure to respond best I can. So, when it comes to how does Maya know these texture coordinates, these sections of the, the model to display and where on the texture, right? This is where UVs come in, and so we're going to need to use the UV editor. So there is a UV editor you can bring up under UV menu here. UV menu is UV editor. And that's this window here. Okay. Now what I'd like to do is instead of having another window, I'm going to close this. I'm going to go to panels, saved layouts, and I'll choose the perspective slash UV editor layout. So that kind of cuts my view in half. I can close the aspect editor to get more space over here. So now I can see the model on the left side and the UV editor on the right side. Now the UV editor is a 2D view of the texture, in this case, this checkerboard pattern. Now it's a little hard to see because you'll notice all these little white lines and then there's white in the texture as well. So what I'm going to show you here up the very top, there's this slider. If you play with this slider, you can kind of see how you can dim the checkerboards. I'm just going to dim it a bit by messing with this little slider here just so I can more easily see these uh, wireframe pieces of my model displayed here. So these pieces are referred to as UV shells. So each one of these is a UV shell. If I right click and hold here in the UV editor you'll notice that I have a new option where I had edge, vertex, faces, and then UVs also before. Now I can do UV shell. I choose UV shell. If I click on any of these it will select that section of the UVs that are displayed here. And then I can move that. You'll see here if I, as I move it how the texture on the left side updates based on how I'm moving this shell on this texture. So this is how you can tell my aware on the texture should this part of the model to be displayed versus that part and so on. You have these UV shells. However, you have to create these UV shells yourself. It's not something that's done for you by Maya. This is a model I've already made prior, so it's already 
have had all the UVs done to it. Okay. So hopefully what's happening so far hasn't been too much of an overload that you're grasping what's going on as far as how the textures interact with the models. They're, they're being displayed on the models. So as I zoom in here, again, all of these points are UVs. If I click, you'll see here I can move this one particular point. And you can see as I move any particular point or select a point, the corresponding point will highlight. You'll see it here it's green. As I move that point, the model is not being moved. That point is not like a vertex being moved to adjust the shape of the model. It's adjusting how the texture is being displayed on the model. You see that, how that black wavy line is happening, is moving? Because I'm just I'm changing how the texture is displayed on the mesh. So try to use your imagination a little bit. If I turn it this way, it might be easier to tell. Like these lines correspond together. And this black checkerboard is coming right through here. Well, it's coming right through there. Okay. And so as I move this this way, the black checker has not changed. And the model hasn't changed, but the space, this, this space right there has gotten wider, right? This point's been moved over here. And so then there's more space here. You can kind of see, hopefully, again, hopefully it's making sense. If you imagine just this triangle and then look at just this triangle and how this shape, this black, is covering, you know, this half of the triangle over here and it's covering this half of the triangle over here. It's corresponding one to one. So what we want to do is make sure that our texture is displaying properly on the model by manipulating these points over here in the UV editor. Okay, so most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you're going to be creating the model and making a UV layout first. So you'll have this UV layout here with this, these two circles here and the square there. And so then I'll go into Substance Painter and I know that that's where this part of the texture is right there, and this part, and this part on the bottom, down there. So the two caps of this cylindrical shape, as well as the middle, are represented by this one, this one, and this one, these UV shells. I'm gonna do all this junk. And so then, of course, there's the rest of it, right? And it's the same concepts. All these pieces are laid out here in different places. You don't want them to overlap. Because if they overlap, that means they're sharing texture space. Let me go back to Maya. Here we go. Let's say I were to put this shell on top of that shell. You could definitely do it. Okay, like so. But what that means, though, is that now they look, you know, essentially identical. So this one's maybe rotated a little bit. And so, for example, let me bring up, instead of this checkerboard pattern, let me put on the actual texture that I had before, right? So I'm gonna, that's a good example anyway, just showing you how to turn, take a texture off of a model, right? Let's say you have this checker on here, you don't want that anymore. I can right click on the color name, right click and break connection. And that removes the texture. So now I no longer have a color texture, I just have a transparency texture. So you see the transparency effect is still there, but the color is now gray. I can right click on transparency and I can say break connection. So now I'm back to my normal shaded look. So I'm gonna right click and hold and I'm gonna say assign existing material and put back on the fire extinguisher material I had before. Okay. So now I'm going to apply a file. So instead of going to checker, I'm going to apply, again, I click that little checkerboard icon. Let me do it again. For the color, click the checkerboard icon file and here it's going to browse for that texture I have so it's a file of somewhere on my computer so I'm going to go find it real quick so we have fire extinguisher slash D or underscore D the D stands for diffuse which is another word for color essentially in the 3d world you also see fire extinguisher AO for ambient occlusion fire extinguisher uh, I don't know why I have matte there, but fire extinguisher N for normal map, that's another texture type. And then MR for metalness roughness, which are another texture type. So again, all these different texture types. 
But I'm going to focus on color right now. So fire extinguisher just D for diffuse or color. Open it up. So there you can see it applied just like you saw earlier. So now let me go back to my UVs. Again, my color has been dimmed. We can kind of see it there as I bring this back up. I'll dim it a little bit just so we can make sure we see. So before I moved this shell over, it was over here. So I had that label there, for example, versus this one does not have a label, right? But if I take this shell that does not have a label and move it over on top of this shell it does, then the label shows up on both. You see that? They're sharing texture space. It's the same texture space on both parts of the model because the shells, the, the UV coordinates for the underside now is in the same texture space as the upper, the upper side up here. I can even move this down here and all of a sudden now I'm getting other weird things happening where like this label is down here and stuff like this. Now typically you don't want to do that. You want to try to not have your texture details uh, duplicated like this because it's not realistic, right? You, don't, you wouldn't have the label down there and there wouldn't be a label at the bottom with this fire extinguisher, right? You're trying to make, uh, at least in this case, I was trying to make something that looked identical to the real thing, okay? So that's why this piece is UV'd in a different place. Now let me bring back all the other pieces here. We have two wheels, and in this case, the wheels share texture space. You'll see as I select both wheels, they're both using the same space because they are identical. I have two wheels, they look the same. And so that's just saving me room. Instead of me having to have another section this big for another set of tire treads and another set of you know hubcaps and things, I can just simply have both wheels share the same UV coordinates, right? We have this post here, we got you know, these pieces. Again, same idea here we have, uh, actually no, let's see here, there we go. These two pieces here, have these kind of two brace metal structures, they're both sharing the same texture space. So you gotta kind of pick and choose where that happens. It doesn't necessarily need to happen everywhere. These two are also sharing the same texture space. They're identical. So it saves room, and this is a little bit more advanced topic, I would say. Let's see, these two are not identical, because I didn't want them to be. Then we have this piece up here. So these are all unique pieces. But as I select all of this, you can see here that the reason why I'm not selecting the hose is the hose is its own separate uh, texture, I believe. Or maybe not, it's down here. But anyway, you can see here as I select all these different pieces, how they're all laid out here in the UV editor. So how do we do this layout process, okay? So there's lots of tools for this. And again, this might take a bit more explanation in another video as we go forward. But let's just say I to make a new, a new piece that looks like this. I'm just gonna copy this. So I'll make a new cylinder. Feel free to just watch, or you can wanna watch along, you, can, you know, go along, you can. So I'm going to scale this up and kind of make it similar girth and height. Again, I'm not worried about being exact. I'm going to close that for now. Take the subdivisions caps down to zero. I'm going to grab the two ends and let's say I extrude them up. Talked about extruding and things yesterday, or not yesterday. I keep saying yesterday, it was a couple weeks ago now. And let's say I take these two faces on both sides and I bevel them. There we go. Take these, grab these, and let's scale them up a little bit. There we go. So there we go, very similar, right? I'm also going to soften the edges. We talked about that in the last video as well. There we go. So now, now it looks, you know, practically the same. Not exactly, but enough. So if you look at the UVs over here, that does not look like this, right? So how do we do that? What do we do? Well, we have to use our tools. So if you look over here in the UV editor, we have lots of menus up here along the top. Lots of stuff in here to talk about. But first of all, with the UV editor open and I click on the model, you'll notice that some of the edges are brighter white versus the green. If you look at these edges along the border of this square, for example, if I select them like this, they correspond here where this 
white line was. So everywhere the border edges of a UV shell are, they show up as bright white here on the model, same as around these two circles and things like that. So you notice here we have one bright white line going down this way. That's the, uh, the side here of this square. So just imagine, again, this square kind of wrapped around this cylinder. This is called the um, seams or borders of these UV shells. And so it's important where those seams show up. Uh, this one you'll see is actually divided right through a label, which is not very smart on my part. <laughs> but because you can see here on the texture, that label is divided right through here on both sides. So I had to make sure they all lined up and everything. That makes a little bit more extra work for me. It would have been probably smarter if I put the seam over here on, after the label so I didn't have to worry about cutting the label in half like that. But in any case, where those texture seams show up is important. We're going to get more into that later. But for now, how do we get this, this layout over here, to look more like this? Let's just say, for example, I apply this material with the fire extinguisher onto this model. So I right-click and hold, assign existing material, fire extinguisher material. There we go. So we can see it, you know, same material, but you notice it looks kind of off, right? And everything's kind of, this kind of stretching happening, okay? Stuff like this. So we have to do what's called UV mapping. We're going to UV, we're going to manipulate the UVs of this shape to look more like this shape. First of all, the first rule of UVs is you do your UVs after your modeling is done. So you've completed modeling an object it's finished. Then you start doing UVs, okay? Because if you go back and change it, I'm going to show you here in a minute, you have to then do UVs again, <laughs> okay? So modeling, any modeling you do can change the UVs. So you have to make sure that after your modeling is done, your UVs are looking the way they want you want them to, and then you move on from there. So let's just say this model is done. Then the first step after completing a model before UVing is you're going to delete history, this blue button here, so it removes all that history. And I'm going to do what's called freeze transformations. Freeze transformations. You'll notice over here, we have all these numbers in the channel box. You know, translate Y is 30 and translate Z is negative, whatever. Scale X is 11, scale Y is 19.908, and so on. I want to freeze transformations so this all gets zeroed out. And this button here looks like a snowflake with 000 in front of it. That's freeze transformations. You can also find it under modify freeze transformations right there. So I'll click on my object, click on this snowflake button. There we go. So now everything's kind of zeroed out back to the uh, kind of a default state. Because the modeling is done. And now I'm going to start doing UVs. Lots of ways to UV something. Not every way, not every model is the same. Every model is different. Okay, so it's kind of on a model by model basis on what's the best way to UV something. And that, again, that takes practice. I'm going to show you a kind of a general method that I use is first of all here in the UV editor really quickly I'm going to just go to create camera based and so what this is doing is create menu here in the UV editor this is all these different tools that can project or manipulate the UVs in some way and unfortunately I don't quite have videos going over all of these as of this recording yet hopefully that'll change soon maybe I'll do one today you know just because um, but camera base, what happens is it takes the camera angle I'm currently looking at the model in and it copies that, just kind of going straight through the model onto the UV uh, editor. So you can see here, it looks kind of weird. From this angle, it looks fine, but then it kind of gets very streaky through here until it gets to this side. This side and that side are, you see this kind of angle. It's like I fired a ray through the object. And that texture, this kind of green circle here, shows up there and goes all the way through to that side, almost like a, a bullet hole. <laughs> you got shot that way, you got, here's the entrance wound, and there's the exit wound, that kind of thing. But that's, that was only with the purpose of getting started. So now I know I want to create my UV seams along the top and bottom of this pill shape, and then I need to see them going down the side. So what I would do is I right click and hold and choose edges, Double click this edge loop, I hold shift and double click this edge loop. And over here, this button is separate UVs, they're also called cut. 
You can also go to the cut and sew menu and choose cut right there. I'll cut. And you'll notice that these lines become that white color because now I've cut the UVs there to create a seam. Now I'm also going to cut one of my vertical edges. I'll just grab with this one for example. Just that one edge and cut. So now you'll notice the UV seams are identical. This one's around both caps, got one down the side. This one's around both caps and got one down the side. But still, nothing's changed about how this is shaped. So now I need to unfold the UVs along these seams I've cut. So if you can imagine, it's kind of a grotesque example, I suppose. But when you're dealing with like animal furs, okay, if you want to, say, have a bearskin rug, right? if you've seen pictures of that, maybe I'll bring up a picture. Bear skin rug, right? So, how was this created, right? If you imagine a bear, they don't—they're not—they're not flat, right? So, you know, whether you're, you like hunting or not, a bear had to be, you know, hunted to create this rug. And so, what they did was they had to slice the pelt of the bear along certain uh, lines and then unfold it to create this to try to be as less as as less graphic as I can to describe that. So it's the same idea. What we've done here, this is our bear, <laughs> and we've sliced it in certain places, and now we're going to unfold it to lay it out like a rug, okay? So there's a button, thankfully, <laughs> that we can do that with. If I go to the UV, there we go, UV Editor Tools, I can say Show UV Toolkit. And this, this is the UV Toolkit, I use it all the time, very important toolkit. And we'll talk more about this as we go forward with texturing. Again, lots of stuff in here. I do uh, encourage you to explore, of course. But where we're going to go is unfold, the unfold section here. And here's an unfold button. There we go. Look at that. It unfolds based on where we cut the model before. So now I have these three different shells that I can manipulate. Okay. Now you'll notice this there, this was at an angle. I'd like it to be straight. Now you could rotate it with the E key, rotate tool. However, just to be sure it's straight, I can right click and hold, choose edge. I can grab one of these edges. And over here I can say straighten shell. And it straightens it based on the edge I selected. It makes that edge straight and then therefore straightens the rest of it, okay? I can grab that shell now. Again, right clicking and holding, I'm choosing UV shell for my component type and then I can move scale and so on and I can try to you know put this shell essentially where I have the other I might scale it out a little bit just to make it you know kind of match but you can kind of see what I'm getting at here I'm kind of placing this shell here for this one here I can place it where essentially that bottom part of the piece is down here I grab this one I can place it essentially where the top part of this piece is something like this. Now you'll notice that it's not exactly the same. I can rotate this shell to move that label around right until I get to about where it was before. There we go. So there I've essentially copied the layout I have here to here. You kind of see if I go back and forth. It's not exactly the same, but it's close, right? So that general process though of Taking your model, let's say I grab you know this piece here. Look at the those white lines. There's essentially a slit all the way along the pipe. I'm just gonna press your control one to isolate this by itself. And then around the edges it's it's just like open. Okay, so then it lays out in this big long straight line like this. If I grab, let's say, this one. This is a little bit more complex shape. Whoops. And so I have a couple different pieces, and they kind of spread out a bit. So here is that base around the bottom of this thing, kind of laid out like this, kind of like the top of the cylinder was before. It's a very similar layout there. But I have a hole cut in where this piece suddenly juts out. Because if this piece kind of sticking all within here to keep it one piece, one UV shell, it doesn't really work that well. So I separated it. You see the white lines there showing the demarcation of where that seam is. And then that piece is over here. And you see here, it's been laid out like this. Got a seam right there. And then it goes all the way around 
the models, no seam there. Kind of comes up like this. And then this top section is over here. It's kind of laid out like this. So a lot of times, so in order to like, again, recreate this, I could say, after I've, you know, I've, I've modeled it. So here's my shaded view, just looking at the model by itself. And I can go to create camera based. So again, it kind of projects the UVs there. And then I can look at this and determine, all right, I want my seams to be in these particular places. I'll grab the edges I want to cut. And again, this is an, a really easy way to start learning how to cut UVs. I'll press that cut button. And then for these faces here, I'll grab these faces up here. And now instead of pressing the cut button, if I want to just cut this whole section out, this button here, which you may not have, because I think I have actually have these buttons uh, set up, but under cut and sew, you have create UV shell as a button. And so all these faces I have selected, I can use create UV shell and it cuts out on the outer ring of those faces I have selected. See that? And then I need one more cut running up and down the side here. Cut there. Again, if you don't see these buttons under cut and sew, cut. Okay. And then I'll press that layout button or unfold button, I should say. There we go. It unfolds like so. I'm going to straighten them. You know, this one's straightened this way, but it can, but whatever the case may be, you, you can straighten shell. Maybe grab this one and say straighten shell. Now another button to, to look at over here is optimize. Sometimes you might notice your, your UVs shift a little bit. And my, this one, for example, is not exactly round. So I'll say optimize and kind of see how it kind of fixes that. So unfold, optimize, straighten shell, all these little buttons here under the unfold section are very handy to learn uh, at the beginning of your UV learning, just to kind of have this handy, be able to do this. And then it's just a matter of, you know, rotating and, you know, get, don't forget, you press to hold that, hold J key to rotate on 15 degree increments. If you want to rotate these, scale them and so on, and place them in your UV layout. Again, we're just scratching the surface of this whole process. So we're going to talk more about this as we go forward, but hopefully this gives you a, a little bit of a foundational start. I know we've talked a good, you know, 45 minutes or whatever it is on this topic. Um, but, you know, we have to start somewhere. And this is a good place to start as any. So, so is, yeah, essentially, to answer your unasked questions, because I can't hear you, after you model your objects, you know, you can do whatever kind of model you want, as complex as you want it, in order, in order to texture it, you have to go through this UV process. And thankfully, this UV, UV toolkit here is very handy. It makes the process much quicker than it used to be, you know, back when I first started, you know, 20 years ago. These buttons and things are makes, makes all that layout process so much uh, faster. So definitely um, get, hand, get used to the idea of creating UVs for your objects and laying them out. Now, you do want to make sure you lay them out in this upper right square. You'll notice that's where the texture I have is displayed so just keep that as a rule of thumb everything goes up here so whatever however complex it is you know all this stuff that i have here it all has to fit um, in that in that upper right square of this grid so just keep that in mind as you go forward too and then of course also try to make it so they don't overlap that's another big deal so lots of little things and again more another advanced little thing try to give a little bit of space in between so they're not like right butted up next to each other. You want to make sure they have a little bit of space in between. And all these little things that come up as you go forward and you learn more and more. Um, but this is not an advanced lesson yet, although I sprinkled some stuff in there, okay? Um, but this is just kind of showing you how to get started with UVs. Now, we haven't talked about like how, okay, now that you have your UVs, like how do you go about making textures for that and so on? We haven't really talked about that yet. Um, we'll try to touch on that more later. I think next video, we're going to go into the hypershade. It sounds like something sci-fi and futuristic. So you'll look forward to that. But in any case, hopefully this was informative and useful to you to kind of get your feet wet and started in the whole texturing process. It is confusing, I understand. Some people have a hard time with the 2D to 3D correlation. Other people have no problem with it at all. So it just depends on you and how your mind works. But hopefully it makes sense, what I've shown you here. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask in the comments below. And I do, again, appreciate you watching this episode of Maya 101. This is Michael. I'll talk to you later.